Good evening, and welcome to the Friday webinars at Wharton Arts, uh, featuring artists of different disciplines making authentic connections between art and life through the sharing of stories, expertise, and creations. My name is Helen Chapio, an artistic director of Wharton Institute for the Performing Arts, and the curator and the host of the Friday webinar series. Wharton Institute for the Performing Arts comprises the New Jersey Youth Symphony, Patterson Music Project, and Performing Arts School as New Jersey's largest nonprofit performing arts education organization, serving over 1,200 students of all ages and abilities through a range of classes and ensembles. Tonight's uh, Friday webinar uh, is titled From Representation to Belonging, Making Performing Arts Education More Inclusive. And we're just so excited and honored to have uh, Dr. Aaron Flagg uh, here with us to discuss the importance of equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging in music education and performing arts. Also followed by a panel discussion or more of a casual conversation, but very important conversation with, with student representatives from our programs, uh, Patterson Music Project, New Jersey Youth Symphony, and Performing Arts School. We have three wonderful students who will be joining Dr. Flagg in a conversation regarding the importance of having a sense of belonging uh, for, uh, for any of us in any uh, situation, but especially in music education and performing arts organization. So let me first introduce to you our um, guest, uh, Dr. Aaron Flagg. He is currently the chair and associate director of Juilliard Jazz Studies at the Juilliard School, where he teaches and manages a highly selective undergraduate and graduate programs. He holds undergraduate and graduate degrees from the Juilliard School and earned his doctorate of musical arts, DMA, from the University of Michigan. He has extensive experience as a performer, educator, consultant, and not profit nonprofit executive. An accomplished trumpeter, Dr. Flegg's diverse performing experience includes concerto, recital, orchestral, chamber, big band, and small jazz ensemble performances around the world. He has performed with the New York Philharmonic, Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, Brooklyn Philharmonic, Queen Symphony, Illinois Jacket, big band, Dance Theater of Harlem, Absolute Ensemble, American Brass Orchestra, and New York Ragtime Orchestra, among many others. Prior to his current role, Dr. Flagg was Professor of Music and Dean of the Hart School of Music at the University of Hartford, also Executive Director of Music Conservatory of Westchester, and Director of the Jazz Studies Program at the University of Connecticut. He has served on the governing board of the Stanford Symphony Orchestra and is currently serving on the governing uh, boards of the League of American Orchestras as the secretary and chair of the Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Also as the treasurer of the Strategic National Arts Alumni Project. In 2021, he was nominated by the governor and approved by the state Senate to be a member of the New York State Council of the Arts. His article, Anti-Black Discrimination in American Orchestra, was published in the Symphony Magazine in the summer of 2020, where he advocated for greater gender and ethnic diversity in the performing arts. He is lecturer and consultant for a wide uh, variety of organizations, especially on diversity and equity and inclusion in the performing arts with foundations and orchestras and education institutions. He's married to collaborative pianist, Christian Estenesco Flag, and both are the proud parent of their son, who is a SUNY Purchase College junior. So uh, before I go on, I want to actually um, uh, tell you that um, we have been very privileged here at Wharton Institute for the Performing Arts to have received um, 
uh, grant to, to really continue to work on diversity and equity, uh, inclusion and belonging here for all of our three programs. And uh, the grant that we have received from Catalyst Fund uh, that's sponsored by the League of American Orchestras has really been the catalyst for our organization in continuing to host events like this, where we can dialogue among students, parents, and local um, arts leaders, educators, and to continue to talk about sometimes very difficult conversations, but very important, and having some authentic moments where we can just gather and hear each other's stories. And we are so uh, grateful for the presence of Dr. Flagg and also our three students, uh, whom we will introduce you uh, very shortly. But we're going to just bring uh, Dr. Flagg on here and um, start us off with um, a welcome. Thank you, Helen. It's a pleasure to be here with Wharton Arts. Appreciate it's really, really great to have you. And thank you so much for all that you're doing, um, not just teaching young musicians, you know, at the Juilliard School, but also really um, taking us uh, and all of the leaders of arts organizations to musicians, to students who are looking at this world um, from their perspective and thinking a lot about what's been going on, especially during the pandemic. But way before. And we are so glad that we can have uh, you to share with us kind of your personal stories as well as kind of the work that you're doing and uh, engaging our students in the conversation. So I'm going to just start off by asking you, why is representation, sense of belonging, equity, inclusion important in performing arts education? Well, the first thing I think about when I hear that type of question is really, um, that the simple answer is we who love the arts want more people to enjoy them. And as I like to say, the arts are about and for humanity. So the more human beings and the more types of culture are included in its creation, the greater the impact of the art itself. And so to the extent that we as, as educators, we as performers uh, limit the amount of influences that can come into the concert hall and into the classroom, the we are limiting the degree of impact for our students and for our audiences. And so I think it's it's critical only in if nothing else, because I love art, I love music, and I want everyone to enjoy it. And I want to enjoy all the types of music from all types of people. I think that's that's a really wonderful opening uh, statement. And I know in your article, I'm not sure if this is readily available, but I was reading, um, you know, uh, on the Symphony League magazine, the, the article that I was referring to. Uh, to um, and I think it's just so important to understand the history, you know, uh, how we got here and uh, where we are and our current situation in so many ways. But I... I just, and then I'm going to try to share that article out with our community, um, you know, it's in, in its PDF form if we can. But I also uh, appreciate kind of the work that you're doing with the league and there is uh, making a case for equity, diversity and inclusion in orchestras or in, in performing arts. And on the cover of that um, document was a wonderful quote from our honorable Elijah Cummings. Um, and I just want to read that and then, you know, maybe have you kind of talk further about that. The Honorable Elijah Cummings, uh, speaking at the League Conference in 2016, uh, said, diversity is not our problem. It's our promise. It's our promise because it leads to unparalleled heights of creativity, expression, and excellence. It's our promise because it leads to higher performing and more sustainable institutions. And it's our promise because it allows us to live by our democratic ideals of fairness and equality. I think it's just so powerful um, to hear that uh, from uh, just an amazing leader for this uh, country. And uh, as a, as a uh, performing arts educator, um, I just want to really share that uh, with a wider community. And I think how you said it was very similar um, to, to what um, Honorable uh, Cummings had said. I want to share with you something that you might um, maybe react to. We didn't really prep this. 
at, at New Jersey Youth Symphony, we had our consultant of diversity and equity last year hold um, a little student session, students of color uh, with our consultant and none of the uh, uh, staff members, including myself, were part of that conversation. There's one quote that our uh, consultant shared with us anonymously. And I live with that every day. One student of color had said, when I'm at New Jersey Youth Symphony and I'm playing in the orchestra, I feel like I belong here. However, when the music stops, I wonder if I really belong here. And so I think this is where we want to be better at it. We want our community to know that, that we have students who might be feeling that way, uh, playing uh, in, in an ensemble, feeling mighty good and feeling a sense of belongingness. But the community itself is not making her feel completely welcomed. So... I too much talking from me. I just want to leave it at that and then maybe have you uh, share with us some of your comments and thoughts. And then when you're ready, maybe we can bring on our students. Sure. No, that's great. And never, not, not too much from you at all. That's really so important. And I think for those who are on this uh, as educators, the concept that it's more than just the music that we're presenting in the classroom that's important that needs to also be diverse and also needs to be welcoming, but that our whole classroom environment, our whole school environment, our whole uh, social environment needs to be welcoming. And again, why? Because we want people to stay engaged with the art form itself, and we want people to feel empowered to contribute to the art form itself, to bring, them, bring all of themselves to the table. I know in my work, uh, be it managing, uh, leading people or, or teaching, that the more ideas that can be on the table, that can be brought to bear, it's like a potluck, the more food that can be brought in, the more the variety of choices and the better the experience is. And so it's really up to us as educators and leaders to really embrace the challenge, but also the opportunity and the responsibility of that promise that Representative Elijah Cummings talked about that is so clear in our, the documents of this country, let alone in the power of music. So. Um, I'm really touched by that quote and the honesty of that student to feel safe enough to share that. And now it's on us and, and on you and your colleagues to say, okay, are you going to stop and say, well, they like the music, so that's all that really matters. I'm not going to worry about whether anyone talked to, to her after rehearsal or engaged her in friendship or in, engaged her family and friends in other ways. And so hopefully knowing you, the answer will be, we're not gonna stop with just the music. We're gonna talk about all things around that. So I think that's really important. Thank you so much for sharing it. Sure, and I, I yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, as we uh, continue to um, work together as a community, because I think it really takes everyone to be in it, not just the leadership, not just a few students of color, uh, but uh, from the board of directors, by the way, our Wharton uh, Arts Board of Directors are fully committed to this work. And we are just so grateful that our strategic plan really includes uh, very specific goals for the next five years in the work of um, continuing to make this community as inclusive and creating a sense of belonging for every student here. Um, but maybe talk about from representation to belonging. What is that? You know, mean for you? No, I appreciate you asking that. Um, and one of the reasons we wanted that to be the title of our time together is to really realize that in the United States and in United States music education, um, this work has existed on a continuum. Um, and that continuum can be thought of as representation, meaning, oh, well, we want to have more, more, more people represented in our setting. And I like to differentiate um, certain things in that. The example would be, uh, you have a dance. I, I like to say, because it was true, in my junior year of high school, uh, this school I went to was very interested in making sure that the prom uh, was diverse, because it generally just had the white students and um, the, in this our case, Latin, Latinx students come, but not the Asian American students, the API students or the black students. So there was a committee that made a concerted effort to invite and bring to the prom more difference into the prom setting. 
And I remember walking in and seeing members of the student committee on that prom really happy and proud of themselves for having increased the amount of difference that was present at the prom. So there was a kind of, okay, we completed our job, we're done. And I was standing there with my punch in hand and thought to myself, well, I'm here, but I haven't been asked to dance yet. I haven't danced, I haven't engaged in the activities that are here for everyone to engage in. But I am, I realized that my representation or representation was their only goal. They weren't interested in including me in the activities. So I, and so then I, so the continuum goes from simply diversity being representation, or you move to the idea of equity and empowerment to feel equally engaged and welcome to, in my case, go dancing or, you know, engage in, in, in having fun at the prom. But I would say beyond equity in a certain way, there is inclusion and belonging, which really is about being invited to be on that committee to plan next year's prom and choose the music and choose where we go and what food we have and to really feel that I too and, and, and my uh, AAPI colleagues could really be welcomed onto the committee and that that was so much more meaningful to us than simply just showing up, which was at that time all the committee cared about. And so I think the parallel exists in classical music and in music in general and in music education in general where we are as people of color, as quote, quote unquote BIPOC individuals, sought out simply for representation purposes. So that we, someone can say at this, in our classroom, we have a lot of diversity, we're done. There's a lot of difference. And I say that is nowhere near enough. People are empowered now to speak up and say, I don't feel comfortable like that young person you referenced. And I think equally important to say, I have some ideas too about how what music our orchestra might play. I've been listening to YouTube and I found this great composer. Could we do this person's music? And so young people aren't always and haven't always been encouraged to speak out. And so since society has changed, and unlike my father, who said, well, children are to be seen and not heard. That was a very old fashioned way of thinking. My son is did not grow up with that and did not believe that. And so our children, wonderfully, are empowered by society to have opinions. And if we as music educators and in the arts do, are not creating an environment where that is welcomed and encouraged, uh, we're going to be in trouble. Um, we're not going to be a place people want to engage. And most importantly, the music, which we all love, will suffer for the lack of engagement from people. So I think this continuum from, from representation being the goal to clearly folks feeling included being the goal is really important. And one last thing I'll say about that is once you go to the end of that continuum or further down that continuum, I should say, the focus becomes other people, not you. It's not what how many recruitment trips I have done that is what is the determination of how successful the process is or how diverse the programming I have created is for my band or choir. That's not the goal. The goal is, are the people who are engaged, how do they feel? How do they feel? And when they tell you they don't feel good, they don't feel welcomed, what are you doing about it? Mm -hmm. So that removes the, it centers the people who have been excluded. And that is often hard for us as adults, as managers, as teachers, as parents to really embrace. So that's why I think discomfort in this work uh, is a sign of growth. Just like when you practice and things don't come easy, you got to keep working on it. That's right. Oh, yes. I think that's that's really wonderful. Thank you so much for that. I think this is, you know, a good time perhaps yes. to bring our students um, to talk about how they are feeling. And so I would like to um, ask our students to come on the video and uh, we will um continue this conversation. And as they do so, I will uh, be really happy to, um, uh, let me just make sure that we are bringing every student in here. There we are. There, there go. we go. <laughs> Wonderful. So let me quickly do an uh, introduction here. We have Rachel Diaz, uh, who is a sophomore, uh, plays the viola and representing our Patterson Music Project.
And also we have Ryoma Taka, Takenaga, uh, who is a senior uh, jazz bassist in the New Jersey Youth Symphony's Jazz Orchestra. And also we have Gabby Hong, who is also a senior a pianist and a violist, but I think more of a, a violist at this point, um, uh, studying at the Performing Arts School here in Wharton Arts. So welcome to all three of you. Thank you so much for being here with us. Okay. Now, yeah, go ahead. You know, and, and I know that in preparation for this um, a webinar, we were just kind of sharing some through via email, uh, some questions and all of that. But um, I'm going to just turn it over to you, Dr. Flag, and you can engage them. <laughs> I will do that. But I will also give a shout out to all of our guests and the attendees to start encouraging you to put your questions in the chat. We want to include everybody. This is not just me talking. It is all of us as a community, even here online, really sharing questions, thoughts, and experiences. And so with that encouragement, I want to turn to our uh, student musicians, our young musicians, I'll say, and really ask a first question of them as we were just talking about feeling included and how in sharing that one a quote from that one student who on the, on, in the rehearsal felt included, but not. I, want, I was curious if each of you can consider a time where you felt included and really engaged in an arts education experience uh, in school, after school, in the summer. And what specific things made you feel that way? I wonder if we can start with uh, Rachel. Do you mind sharing us sharing with us your thoughts about that? All right. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, one moment that I felt included was when I participated in uh, the Eucharist orchestra of uh, Los Angeles's summer festival um, and a few things that really made me feel included was being able to see other students who also uh, were Latinx um, kids so I felt like I wasn't the only one who was who had the same background um, we also did an activity uh, with Las Cafeteras which is a um, a band known in, in California, where we were saying, where are, where am I from? Like, where are you from? Where do you come from, right? And it wasn't just your where your parents came from, it's also where do you come from? Like, not only uh, location-wise, but passion-wise. Like, And I realized with that activity, we all come from different places. We all come from different locations, but we, all ended up also coming from music and also coming from the passion of music. So being able to see that despite different backgrounds, we all have the same. All right, so it, it sounds, it's really amazing, Rachel. And it's so wonderful how you pointed out the idea of seeing other people like you was one reason that you felt included, but then also it sounds like from that activity, noticing the difference uh, of all of these people. And despite all that difference, we all have come together. And so seeing both things seem to have been really reinforcing for you. It, would that f be a fair way of summarizing that? That'd be perfect. Okay, well, we like perfect, so that's great. Thank you. I wonder, uh, I'll stop it perfect. Uh, Gabby, your thoughts about that same question? Uh, yeah, so this is one of my experiences with um, the performing arts school actually. Um, last year, uh, I had this project idea um, of being a teacher's assistant or entering uh, beginner classes um, and playing. Um, and I wanted to focus on um, music by composers from underrepresented backgrounds um, and not only play, but also talk about the history because I'm also interested in music history um, and Wharton Arts was really enthusiastic and supportive about this. Um, and I got the chance to uh, perform for one of my former teachers. Um, back when I was a toddler, I took her class. Um, and I got to be a teaching assistant mentor uh, throughout the year, which is really great. Um, not just to learn these pieces and learn more and educate myself, but also to share that with young kids as well. That's great, that's great. And it sounds like what the 
the program did was support your idea and your interest. So yeah, yeah, exactly. you felt included because they said yes to your idea of, hey, I'd like to do this and I'd like to talk about the history. Is there a way for me to do that? And it sounds like the organization made that happen. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, that's great. That's great. Uh, thank you. Uh, how about uh, Rioma? Your thoughts about uh, a situation where you actually felt included and specifically what helped you feel that way? Yeah, so a uh, time where I felt included is, was during a program called the National Youth Orchestra, um, which I did this summer. Uh, and this was a life changing experience because I had never felt this included. Uh, and so one reason for that, I think it's beautiful how uh, all these different roads are coming together to create this uh, music. And so that leads to people of different backgrounds as uh, Rachel and Gabby stated. Um, and I think that was something that really made me feel comfortable uh, being able to share experiences, even though they're from the other side of the country. That was something that I was really amazed by because um, in other programs, I haven't felt uh, a, an environment where I could openly talk about uh, my deepest experiences and uh, my troubles with uh, you know, race and um, other uh, experiences. So that was something that was really special to me. And I ended up creating this little unofficial affinity group of the um, students of color which was something that I had never experienced before to have that many friends. And now I can consider them my closest friends. And just to have music as something that brought us all together was something that I felt was really special. I'm just, I'm resonating with what you said, similar uh, to Ra Rachel in a way of being through this particular music experience, seeing so much difference, seeing people from, in this case, different geographic locations and realizing the power of music to be a common language and a connector for you. Um, and for you, that difference in part was geographic, but then also that the program supported the students desire and need to be together and have an affinity group. Um, so however they, I imagine that wasn't in the brochure. I'm sure it was something that had to be, people had to be open to allow happen and to facilitate in some way. That's really, really helpful. Oh, go ahead. Were you going to add something? No, yeah. Um, yeah, it definitely wasn't something that I expected going into it. Um, I had a few friends that I also who also got in, and uh, they were also students of color. And so I felt like I had a few friends, but I wasn't uh, ready to meet all these different kids. And I think one of the things is that the program was something that was, it was completely free. And so that meant that everyone from all different backgrounds uh, were able to come together and share their experiences as well. Right. That's a very important point of un, of removing barriers, lowering the barrier, be it financial, be it uh, you know, language, be it geographic, the idea of lowering barriers. That's really, really helpful. And I just want to pause and encourage again, we all need encouragement for our attendees to put a question, a thought, a reaction, whatever resonated with you in the chat. This is a, a conversation with all of us through this technology. So that's, that's wonderful. So with this idea of, of the specific things that made you feel included, it's always good to be to see both sides and flip the coin. And could you share a situation where you clearly didn't feel in, included and be as specific as you can as to what made you feel that way? Why, you know, why did you feel not included? Uh, Rachel, do you mind? Yeah, so one time I didn't feel included would probably be when I was performing one time at, I forgot the place, I think it was during the, we were performing at a high school and we were the only act that had people of color, everyone else was white, so it was kind of uh, and very strange situation to be in. It was really uncomfortable and unwelcoming. It almost felt like, yeah, like we were the only ones there. It almost felt like we were the diversity kids. We weren't just an act. We were, yeah. 
Wow. Well, let me ask one other follow up to that, if I may. So it, uh, it's clearly the idea of not seeing, I mean, that's really powerful, the idea that you felt like the diversity act, as opposed to another musical act in the show, or I, I don't know what the show was, but w were, was there something that people said or did beyond the, the groups that were present, physically present, that, that added to that feeling? No, it's not necessarily just that. It's also, I think it was just enough to be there. That was enough to see it. But apart from that, it was almost like you could tell about the 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 actual kinds of music that was being played. Like we were the only ones kind of played music that was um more like by Latin X or like by people of color composers, like black composers. Everyone else kind of played more um, Eurocentric music. Okay, so it wasn't just the the dip, the uh, hom homogeneity of the people; it was also the programming seemed to be of a very specific type and not welcoming. Okay, now that's very helpful to be specific because you, the feeling you had uh, is genuine and valid, and for us to understand and feel that and be empathetic to that. Uh, we just need to really help us paint the picture clearly. So thank you for allowing me to ask that follow up. Thank you. How about Gabby for you? Um, yeah. And, and uh, one other thing I should say, please feel free to not feel pressure to name the organization or the teacher or anything. We're more concerned about what was done and how you felt. That's all. Um, so I am a senior and I am looking to uh, major in viola performance uh, in college and one typical uh, part of the process for prospective music majors is to take trial lessons uh, with professors they want to study with um, and I had a trial lesson um, with a professor and unfortunately it didn't really go the way I wanted to. Afterwards I, I was feeling really discouraged and, and it didn't go well even though I was happy with how I played um, and I thought about everything that this professor said to me and what had happened and one part of it was that I just didn't click with this professor's teaching style like that happens sometimes um, but actually during this lesson um, we talked about music and academics because I am applying to college and afterwards, this professor had made a comment which really rubbed me the wrong way. Um, they were referencing the stereotype that East Asians um, are always very high achieving, always very smart. Um, and I obviously, I didn't like the feeling of being stereotyped. And I definitely wondered if this professor saw me as more um, than the stereotype. Um, so I really felt in, uh, disengaged and discouraged after this. That's, um, I'm sorry to have all of you have to relive those uncomfortable moments, but I really appreciate you sharing them because for I think many people, um, you know, to them that may have been an, an unconscious almost comment. Uh, and, and we all are used to people saying, well, oh, that wasn't my intent, or I didn't intend to make you feel bad or intend for that. My intent was this. And I always like to say in this work, your intent does not matter. What matters is impact. And that's very hard for all of us as human beings to consider that change of perspective because we we know what we think, what we feel, but to really in, in, in this work of inclusion, of wanting people to feel included, if you sincerely want that, you have to prioritize above yourself the impact on other people and really focus on that. So I appreciate you sharing that being uh, labeled with any stereotype is no fun and because it takes away your personhood it reduces you to something that's a caricature and especially after spending time with someone in a lesson or a class you would hope that they see the uniqueness of you and honor that so thank you for that very very clear example um Rioma, your thoughts yes yeah, so uh my scenario or my experience is slightly different because it was kind of like uh indirect exclusion and so there's this program that uh i was planning to apply to um similar to myo uh, it was another national band called the next gen jazz orchestra uh who uh where they play at the monterey jazz festival 
And um, one thing, the 2019 orchestra, uh, when I was, that was when I, the first concert that I saw of the orchestra that made me want to play. But one thing that I noticed was the whole band uh, was white. Um, I believe there was one Asian uh, player, but other than that, the whole band was white. And jazz, uh, particularly being Black American music, I think it's, it was shocking to me to see a fully white band representing the nation's uh, music. And so this uh, caused me to feel excluded just because me and my friends were uh, planning to apply to this program, but uh, we were turned uh, discouraged and turned away from it just due to the fact that uh, it appeared to be a very uh, exclusive environment uh, or an environment where there was a clear majority. And I think that this also comes out of the fact that it was uh, a program that requires money and um, so for a lot of my friends, access was very limited to that program. And so that kind of leads me into some other experiences I've had where um, I've felt excluded, again, to uh, lack of access and also just had there being a big majority and just not being able to uh, click with other musicians. You know, it's, it's, I think it's so important for us to hear that um, because as an educator, it's easy, it, it's a, it can appear shocking to someone that, well, you mean you didn't even audition for the group? You didn't hear how good the group sounded? You, you basically made a decision not to even try to engage because of your perception of what was on that stage? Wow, you know, like it's very sometimes hard for people to embrace that, but it's, it's important for us to hear it and, and to take that in to say, okay, if you really want to um, have people be included, it is a part of this spectrum that there's a representation uh, enough to invite them to consider the organization. Some sign that says they would be welcomed. And so um, uh, it's very interesting. I, I paused when you were mentioning that particular situation, because I know everybody in that band and there are actually several uh, people of Latinx backgrounds, but uh, you know their particular skin tone wouldn't necessarily lead you to know that just by looking. And so um, it to me, it just makes it even more clear how important it is for organizations, for music programs to be very purposeful and very explicit about who and is welcomed. Um, be that uh, putting. I know one organization in Miami, we're, we're working with them to even put the programs in Spanish as well as English in a city that's 30% Latinx. Uh, there's a resistance to that. And so, oh, it's more money. So I think it's important for all of us to really hear how you all feel as a, as a part of making change. So I really appreciate that. Now, I've been... Uh, I Oh. Can I can I just interject here a little bit because um you know I mean I have sleuth of personal stories but I just wonder Rioma um what would you have wanted to see from that program uh as an invitation for you to want to audition because it's an excellent group and musically you probably would have benefited from you know auditioning and maybe getting in and by doing so maybe you can start um help to diversify the group you know i'm being a, a, a bit of uh you know devil's advocate here because as a person of color i wonder you know what is my role here is it my job to do this or is it the what so organization in us um and and being on this side uh looking at kind of demographics of our new jersey youth symphony and performing arts school this is something i struggle with and i would just love to hear what would you want it to see in their material or in their invitation? I don't know, Aaron, this is to, to you too, but. <laughs> oh, Rioma first. Yeah, well, um, first of all, I think that's a really important perspective uh, that I didn't consider when I was first uh, planning to audition simply because um, uh, I think inclusion is something that I really value just because that is something that directly causes me to play uh, more expressively and just overall 
uh, share my voice. And so at the time, that was something that I kind of saw, oh, uh, maybe this wouldn't be as uh, an ex um, including environment or inclusive environment. Um, and maybe that would make me feel uncomfortable and not play good. But um, I do see the value. And I, I think it is important that uh, certain students uh, take initiative and join these programs to encourage other musicians uh, because it does have to start somewhere. And so um, I'm very fortunate to have a friend group. And so uh, maybe next year I'll apply with my whole friend group and see who gets in and start from there. There we go. Take over. I love it. Take over the band. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's wonderful. Well, look, in all of this, we're all learning. Hopefully, we're all learning from each other. Nobody's perfect. We have all things to learn. So I've been uh, giving you all questions, and I want to be able to turn the tables in fairness. And I know you had some questions you wanted to ask, but as we get ready to do that, um, I would, again, encourage our attendees uh, to put something in the chat. Don't be shy. We'll jump in and, and respond to it. Any thoughts you have, please use that lovely chat function. So I'll um, ask, we'll stay with the same order. That seems to be fair, if that's okay. Uh, uh, Rachel, what questions do you have? Or what question do you have? Yeah, so what, what my first question is, how can diversity, inclusion, and belonging uh, help the performing arts evolve? Well, uh, Rioma just answered that beautifully by, by the idea like, well, if we, uh, instead of avoiding it or, or moving away, but actually feel empowered to help make change, even in terms of who's in the ensemble, that's a, that's a way of helping them evolve by helping directors and open minded, wonderful directors like Helen here, who would be willing to say, can you give me some ideas of how we can recruit better? What language in our brochure should we reconsider so people can feel more excited about the experience? So not having that diversity, having um, people in an organization, no, no matter what type of homogeneity is there, if it's all white, if it's all Latinx, if it's all AAPI, um, anything that's uh, homogeneous like that, it's very easy for status quo to sit in. And it's just, this is the way we do things. So I think any type of difference, and the more difference, the better, will just cause things to evolve as long as there is leadership open to welcome in those ideas that's not just people it's the music we play it's how we play the music you know do we have to play the music this way what if we did it this way well we haven't done it that way before well let's try it and <laughs> let's see what happens i think so more difference is good and and that's how i think performing arts in general will, will evolve and last comment if you can think of things like wonderful pieces in classical music, be it the Turkish marches in Mozart or the, the Borjak's New World Symphony and the quotes from whether it's African-American spirituals or pentatonic scales from Native Americans, all of these things help enliven those composers' music. And same thing with Eddie Palmieri and his use of the piano as a drum. And just that concept, which he got from Africa, was, was a way of in helping him evolve his art form. So, or, so this is the way arts evolve in general. And so it's important. Um, how about Gabby, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so a lot has happened over the past year, not only with the pandemic and its impact on the performing arts, but also with social justice um, and discussions about different movements. What do you think is the most pronounced or profound change in the arts because of um, the past year and a half? And what do you hope to see more of in the future? The pro most pr pronounced change. You stopped me on that one um, because in many ways, I think this is a return. Um, arts and artists are the activists. We are the voice of new ideas. And we're the voice that consolidates and takes, in essence, a picture of what's happening at a time. And there have been rebellions and protests throughout uh, history. And arts have always capsulized that in a song, in a painting, in, in a piece of art. So 
to me, we're returning to what our role includes. The role of artist includes documenter of, of time. And so as we are in this uh, social unrest, uh, the, the level of division, um, as we saw from the pandemic, I'm seeing here in New York is, as we are starting to come back, people are hungry. They're hungry for the arts, for the arts sake. They're hungry because the arts represent community and community building and so being together. And so I think our, one, I see is this period as a return, a reminder to all of us as artists as to the importance of art. Um, and the second part of your question had to do with what, uh, how, what will be happening in the future. Could you repeat that last part? For me? Uh, yeah, what do you hope to see more of in the future? Oh, so I hope to see more of, um, I hope to see more people feeling empowered to speak up. And, and one way of looking at it, one paradigm would be more young people like yourself uh, speaking up and feeling empowered to speak up and learning how to do so effectively. Uh, I had a student in here uh, a couple of weeks ago was very upset and they were they were yelling and I was sitting and listening and this was 10 15 minutes of them being upset and after they started after a while they started to get softer and softer because I was just listening. I hadn't argued I hadn't said anything I just was listening and I said uh, so do you think I heard what you said. And they stopped and said, uh, well, yeah, I think so. I said, why do you think I heard what you said? He said, because you've just been listening. You haven't been fighting me. <laughs> I said, well, that's, isn't that interesting? So maybe uh, one thing to learn before we get into solving the problems you've brought up, which I'm happy to do, is that you don't always have to yell. And, and just for that person was like, oh, that's a new skill. It's like a new scale to learn. Oh, that's something I hadn't really thought about. So I think our job is to support you and support everyone to feel empowered to speak up. And I hope that continues. I also hope that for the arts, the current uh, awareness of the lack of diversity in programming and staffing and on boards and all the statements that are going out, uh, at least last year, definitely, you know, I like people of color. Okay, great. That, that we can move past statements to action and that the action will not be performative and only last for a year and then fade away. But that we keep the, the encouragement, I won't say pressure, the encouragement for folks to continue diversifying, to continue looking for new great music to bring to bear and rethink canon. And so I just hope it continues and we need all of us together to make that happen. All right, uh, Rioma, your, your question. Thank you both for those questions. This is great. And I love the fact that young people are asking me a question. I love that. All right, go ahead. Yeah, so as a jazz musician, uh, one thing about inclusion that has been important is also gender. And so in jazz, there has been a uh, lack of representation for years uh, in women. And uh, just recently, uh, women, have started to get the recognition that they deserve and the women in jazz moving movement has uh, really grown. And so I was wondering, what are your suggestions for helping to solve the gender disparity that has existed and continues to exist uh, in jazz music today? So I think one is to talk about it and to point it out and to say, okay, just like we've said earlier, what are we doing to, to recruit women into the music? Let's understanding research teaches us that women drop out of jazz after middle school, right around seventh, eighth grade, first year of high school. That's when there's a lot of dropping out. And so we need to understand as a field of education, music education, in this case, jazz, what's causing that and how can we reverse that? A lot of it, as we know, is social, a sense of isolation but it's also misogynistic comments, um, uh, the way people talk and act, isolation. In so, so many ways, exclusion is, is the same. No matter what your gender is, what your religious background is, and your ethnicity, it often takes similar forms of antisocial behavior, objectification, or as we mentioned with, with Gabby's example, just stereotyping people in a way that is uh, that takes away the individual from the situation. So I think the music field needs to, one, talk about it, acknowledge it, 
uh, those in power like myself need to be held accountable for what we're doing, how we're doing on that issue. Um, and we need to, uh, it's almost like my mother used to say, if you're gonna have people come over to the house that you're gonna invite, make sure that when they enter the house, it feels and looks to them like you expected them to come and that you wanted them to come. So that means clean up your dirty room, Aaron. That means let's make some food for people that they might like. Let's, you know, act like you're, you want them to feel welcome. And so I think that type of idea applies to our cultures. What, what, what is acceptable to say or not to say? Let's talk about how we speak to each other. Let's hold ourselves accountable with clear principles that students and faculty are empowered to uh, speak to. I was talking to my students the other day, or when we started this year, and we're all wearing these, you know, wearing these masks, of course. I'm in my own room, so I'm locked up. Um, but I said to students in orientation, I want you to feel empowered that if I have my mask on and I drop it below my nose, to tell me, hey, Dr. Flag, your mask, oh, and I will, I promise you that my reaction will be, oh, thank you very much. And I'll put it back up. Something that simple is empowering. It starts to try to model that it's okay. I want you to correct us. I want us to get better. And so I think uh, culture change, understanding through research why this is happening and aggressive uh, actions to correct it um, and accountability are things that we can do. And of course, uh, what is also on that list is helping all students get better. Because no matter if it's music or if it's athletics or if it's science, you have to know, you have to be prepared. You have to be able to play. So I'm also not a fan of having people included who aren't ready to play just because they're women or just because they're Latinx or just because of anything. Because um, that's not fair to that student to be put in a situation that they're not prepared for. Um, it's, it's, it's doubly disrespectful. So I hope, but at the same time, the recruitment uh, is also part of this. There are women who can play and who want to be seen playing. They're out here. We don't need to wait 20 years. They're here now. So I think all of those efforts are important, but the first is to not be afraid to point it out and talk about it. Does that help? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and you know, um, when you and I were talking, uh, Dr. Flake, before, this is prior to this, you had mentioned when you first got to Juilliard and, you know, the jazz department, there were some pictures of great jazz musicians. Oh, can you talk to, to, can you tell them that story, what you did? Yeah, actually, you can see the pictures behind me. So, uh, my, so the there's a big picture behind me with, you can't see it, but there's like, Famous trumpet player, oops, famous trumpet players on the wall. And one of my faculty members brought it in and said, oh, this lady had this in her basement. And I said, what, we have to have that, I have to have it. You know, we'll frame it up and put it up. And so we had that picture up, sorry, my camera's readjusting. And uh, I was talking about gender diversity at home and at the program, I'm very fired up about that topic. And so one day my son who is in high school was sitting in the office, right? and. Uh, I had come back from a class. He was doing homework on my desk before we went home. And he looked up, he said, you're always talking about the lack of gender diversity, but all you have is men up in your office. And I was like, man, you're right. And I immediately ran to the computer and I ordered five pictures. Two of them are in the room. The guy, that's Lena Horn over here in the corner, one of her first press shots. And that's Mary Lou Williams great pianist composer, the Nadia Boulanger of jazz. And so that idea of my son correcting me is what we have to invite, because that was a blind spot. And so I was like, great, let's address it. So I think help comes from all sides. Even though I'm passionate about inclusion, I'm not perfect. The stuff I don't know, I need, I need help. But because if to the extent you believe that I'm sincere, then you would feel welcomed, encouraged to help me. So hopefully that uh, helps address that question. 
Yeah, I, I love that story. So, I'm, so thank you so much for that. There is a question. I don't know if you can see, but I'll read it. Um, this question is for Dr. Flagg. Can you please address diversity of thought and musical styles? Many in jazz want to stick to learning and playing the standards, uh, yet the new generation of young jazz musicians want to innovate the sounds of jazz. What do you suggest to those who are pushing forward from the old school of jazz and diversify the sound of modern jazz? It's a very <laughs> sophisticated question. Sure, I have a, a sinking suspicion that uh, Ryoma's family is involved in this question. <laughs> Uh, so, no, it's a great question. I think uh, one way into answering that is to step back. When someone says they want to play basketball, or I want to be a scientist, or I want to be a horticulturist, or I want to be a writer of poetry, um, when people say those types of things, the natural assumption is that you actually want to be a part of the tradition of poetry, that you know something about poetry, that in order to uh, develop in your craft as an athlete, you need to work on your body, yes, but you need to you need to know the rules of that sport that you want to participate in. Now that doesn't mean you can't innovate and evolve those rules around poetry, say, or what have you, but the first job is to learn what the rules are. And so, <laughs> and learn what, what has come before you. So I find it hilarious that there's often this pitting of of understanding the rules with innovation. It's almost like nobody goes to cooking school thinking they're going to make an omelet the same way the rest of their life. They go to cooking school to learn the traditional ways to make omelet and to make it clearly and make it well. And then they go, okay, here's what I want to do with that. It's all part of it. But too many times people enter jazz music, they don't do this with classical music, they don't do this with ballet. They don't do this with Shakespeare, and, and they, but they do this with jazz as a style. So talk about like second class citizenship. This second class citizenship style is, is thought of as not as serious as everything else. So people go, well, I want to call myself a jazz musician and play pop music. I want to call myself a jazz musician and do none of the tenets of jazz. <laughs> <laughs> do no swinging, no blues, no no danceable, swingable rhythms that aren't a backbeat. Like I, but I want to call myself a jazz musician. I, I'm always like, why do you want to call yourself a jazz musician if you don't want to do anything connected at all with jazz? And the reason is they want the the perceived uh, elegance and respectability of jazz, but not actually do any jazz. So I'm not against people playing pop music. I play in a funk band. I want people to play all types of music. But if you're going to say you, study, you, you play jazz, know something about jazz. Every style out of jazz developed out of a specific musical device. Bebop came out of a development of rhythm out of the swing era. The bebop musicians knew swing style music, and they knew what they were doing when they innovated. They knew what they were changing. Beethoven and the Eroica, he knew what he was doing by not doing a French overture at the beginning and having a long, slow, drawn out beginning, adagio, if you will, largo many times, and then have the, the main theme. He said, forget that. Boom, boom, boom. boom and then here's the theme. So he, he understood what the function of the tradition was before he changed it. So I'm, I'm, I'm all for changing stuff, but know what you're talking about. Does that hopefully that helps answer that question? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, we can probably go on and about that. It's just I think also, let's say if you're really, um, you know, you honor and you've learned that. And I think it's more of a jazz kind of a talk of, you know, pushback, maybe from institutions of students innovating uh, beyond kind of into the modern things. But I think at the end of the day, um, you know, my humble opinion is that here in this kind of conversation, um, I think giving student uh, a, a little bit more voice and maybe having the uh, professors guide them, but not, you know, kind of uh, shut them saying, oh. you know, right. I think that was kind of the, the gist of the question of what about, you know, students wanting to kind of uh, uh, innovate a new sound of jazz. I think your answer is absolutely right that you got to know what you're doing and then... Yeah. 
I mean, that's yeah. great. I just want you to know what you're innovating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like if you just like. Absolutely. I, yeah. The, right. All these interviews of jazz, like, oh, this new sound. What are you thinking? Well, this is how kind of my feeling. And I was <laughs> reflecting. I'm like, <laughs> you're feeling what you, okay. You, can you write it down? What you're feeling? Do you know what you're innovating? Right. And I'm not, I'm more concerned for them. Cause if uh, there was a hip hop artist I did a record with, or I did a record for, and it was his first uh, record on um, this record label. He had a three record deal. So we were up recording to like two in the morning. I'm doing all the horn parts and stuff. And I said to him, I said, how many songs you have? And he showed me this handbook, this, this notebook. And he had like eight songs. I said, don't you have a three album deal? He, he said, yeah. I said, how, how long have you had these songs? Or these are all the songs I've written. <laughs> I was like, well, do you have a, a way that you write or, you know, structure or like a thought? No, man, these uh, this comes up to me. These are all I have for like five years of writing. I said, well, how are you going to write the next two albums? <laughs> and his eyes got really big, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, I, I don't know. So, I, you know, there is a part of this that is craft that you know what you are doing. You are changing the rhythm. You are deciding to go into seven and to flip the harmony. You know, right. I, I just want people to know what they're doing. So yeah, that, and I think it's also the respect for the art form. You know, yeah. people people kind of throw the word jazz around uh, without the the proper respect. They don't know what it is. But to your point, as for educators, yeah, diversity of thought is good. Diversity of musical styles is good. And for a student, if you feel challenged and boxed in take that as an, an opportunity to get more educated so that you can explain what your thought is and why you're doing this, you know? Okay. Uh, and the other thing is, it's also a testament of your fortitude and your grit and your strength and conviction and what you believe that you're not gonna let anything stop you. I want to play this way, so I'm going to play this way. Great, you gotta also have that too. So it's, it's an interesting mix humility to learn and improve your craft, but also clarity of vision that motivates you to do what you want to do. And you need to find people like uh, Rioma has done with his affinity group and friends, find people who will support what you want to do. You know, and as Maya Angelou says, when people show you who they are, believe them. So if you have a teacher, a classmate, a friend who's not supportive, don't get angry. Just go, okay, they don't support me. <laughs> Let me go find somebody else to deal with. That's beautiful. There's another question. What advice would you give to new music educators regarding how to create an inclusive and equitable classroom environment? Um, <laughs> my first reaction is want to do that. Want to do that. To the extent you really want to create an inclusive and equitable classroom, you will want to do that. It, the, the degree of your want will drive your actions. I don't know how old your students are, what have you, but uh, my first reaction would be to walk into a school. I would go visit other classrooms. I'd be asking students, who has the most inclusive classroom? Where do you all feel good? You know, and learn, go study, see what they're doing. And then ask your students, how you all feeling? Or ask the parents, you know, become a detective. If I wanted to go, uh, if I wanted in high school to go out with someone on a date and I really wanted to, to go out with them, I'd wanna get their number, I'd talk to friends, what, what type of color does she like? What type of food is her favorite food? Where does she like to go? I wanna do everything I can so that I'm, I, it's obvious to everyone. Wow, he wants to go out with this person. Wow, this teacher really wants an inclusive classroom. They're trying really hard. People, 80% of what we teach as educators is who we are. 80% of what we teach, what people receive, I should say, 80% of what they receive is the feeling of who you are as a person. So at a certain point, you have to trust that you do want that and you are going to get to that. And it just may take time. I know that seems quite intangible. I didn't tell you what store to go to or what website to look at, but it is actually helpful if you think about it. So thank yeah. you. 
Yeah, that that's a great question. And you know, our um, our consultant for the past two years, um, she has kind of uh, reminded us to assume complexity uh, about other people. And I kind of try to really uh, live by that and dissect that each time. You know, um, something simple as to, you know, when we, uh, when I'm in a rehearsal and I have, you know, a student running in really late, you know, huffing and puffing. Before I go, well, why are you late? <laughs> I have to assume complexity. I have to, you know, really uh, understand something. There must be a really really important reason or whatever it may be. And not to assume uh, from my perspective and from what little I know of that situation, but to always give the benefit of the doubt of other people um, and to ask, you know, and always come from a, a point, a place of, you know, listening to understand uh, and not to um, make up my mind before I know what's going on. And that really has um, really taught me to pause for those five seconds. Right, right. There's a great book uh, by Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And the first one, uh, one of the habits is seek first to understand, mm -hmm. then to be understood. Mm -hmm. And most of the times that I have acted in a non-inclusive manner, I recognize it as me focusing on myself and me wanting to communicate, I'm in charge of this class or, you know, here's the rule and stopping and going, what are you doing? It's not about you. What does the student feel? What, what's going on for them? Create a space for them to speak up. But, you know, as we do this work, we're all going to make mistakes and we have to give ourselves and give those we interact with grace. And grace is defined as unmerited, meaning you're not worthy for it, unmerited favor. We have to give ourselves that as we try to do something that we weren't brought up to do, include other people. That's not how we're brought up. We're brought to just care about yourself. <laughs> so we have to give ourselves grace as we learn how to do that. And when we mess up, I mess up every day, say, I'm sorry, let me try again. Give yourself grace. Um, and it will become a much easier road. And I appreciate the questions in the chat. Please keep them coming. Do not be yeah. shy. We love them. <laughs> right. We just have a few more minutes um, left of this uh, wonderful conversation. And I just want to really um, thank every uh, student here, you know, Gabby, Rachel, and Rioma for uh, really kind of opening up and, and sharing your stories. And uh, I want to continue to really encourage our community, whether you're a parent or you're an educator who are um, teaching our students or outside of our you know, community at large, uh, you know, we really want to hear from you and we really want to be accountable um, uh, to what we say that we're doing, we meaning uh, Wharton Institute, uh, and uh, we need the community to hold us accountable for that. It's hard to be objective sometimes when we are busy doing um, things and so students, especially students, to really raise your voices and uh, not be intimidated uh, for anything uh, and we really want to cultivate that kind of um, community where we is better than me, um, you know, and that whole kind of concept of Ubuntu, uh, I am because, you know, you are and, um, you know, we are because you are and that interconnectedness of who we are. And I think in the work of creating this community, um, it's just, I really go back to the word, what you just said, Dr. Flag, grace. And I think that's uh, something that, you know, daily uh, practiced uh, can really help us to go further uh, in this work. That's not going to be done, <laughs> you know, ever done. It's an ongoing work. Um, and myself personally, as, a, as an immigrant uh, coming from mm -hmm. the other side of the world, uh, having experienced the feeling of exclusion, feeling of just not belonging, you know, anywhere uh, for whatever reason that that I cannot change because it was just who I am was so different. And even now, you know, in 2021, um, I'm always looked at as a foreigner just because how I look. And I think that's a lot of the, you know, uh, the look of it initially. Um, 
uh, is, is the barrier. And so um, I try to really practice the same kind of grace uh, of not assuming. Uh, and and it's, it's a daily work. So I really appreciate this time together. I really want to create this kind of space, safe space, and to have um, someone like you, Dr. Flake, who's really um, out there helping us to listen to each other. I think that's that's such an important role, um, and we are so grateful. And I am very, very uh, appreciative of your work out there. Well, thank you. And, this, and the feeling's quite mutual, and I'm so excited by these young people that you uh, brought forward. It's, it's, I, it's just so exciting and heartwarming to know that they're, they're coming up to take over. And yes. <laughs> a better job than we have. And, uh, you know, it, it is important work. And I think it also is work that will allow us, that will free us to focus on the music. Yeah. And to get our craft to develop, get our playing together and learn as much music if we are free from the burden of feeling excluded and feeling not welcomed and feeling the opposite, that the music field needs each of you in whatever seat you want to take on the bus. Uh, to keep the music going. So thanks so much for having me here tonight. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you so much, Gabby. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you so much, Rioma. Um, all of you are really, really wonderful citizens, and we look forward to uh, being on that journey together with you. And I also want to thank um, our uh, manager of orchestras, Alyssa, who, who's been supporting us, you know, uh, with the technical uh, things so that we are still online and also. And thank you for those of you who are, you know, uh, with us here in the webinar, but also watching on YouTube Live, and it will be available on YouTube on our WhartonArts.tv channel. So. Um, share it out. Uh, and um, thank you. And let's keep on talking and listening to each other. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks.